and he has like 110. So at, le at least I have uh, half of the, the slides that he has. Um, I usually I could have speak about spoken about Yurk, if you know what I mean, <laughs> but uh, Yurkto in English. Uh, but today, yes, it's going to be about uh, uh, file system performance in um, with modern <coughs> file systems. So I'm the creator of Bootlin. I like to participate to this conference to um, spend time exploring things um, and, and sharing the, the results with you. So that's the abstract just for people reading the slides. Uh, so I'm not a file systems expert. There was a great conference about that like, like one or two months ago. Uh, I'm just a regular embedded Linux engineer, like, like, like you are. Um, and I was given a, a significant amount of time by my company, Butlin, to do some research uh, on this topic. Uh, so I'm grateful for Butlin for following me to do that. I actually uh, did that presentation, a similar presentation for those who were here uh, about uh, 13 years ago. So it was, the, uh, a refresh was due, right? Uh, it was using the the Beagle board, if, if some of you remember. So why this talk? Uh, because, um, well, now rotating block devices are very rare now, especially in embedded systems. However, uh, the, most of the file systems we're using are still based on, 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 on uh, still using, uh, were still created when we had rotating storage. So we have like, we've had some evolutions and new, new file systems have appeared as well, like F2FS, EuroFS. So I wanted to benchmark those uh, and see how they, uh, how they perform. So um, yeah, let's try to see what, can, what can, could be good solutions for your systems. However, it's hard to, um, it's hard to predict exactly how they will behave. Uh, file systems is a huge topic, so I'm just trying a few things and don't take my results for granted. They are just on the hardware I tested. Uh, and I, I, uh, I still had limited times. So we could we we do projects as well, so uh, <laughs> I couldn't spend like how much time as, as I wanted. Uh, I did the tests on MMCSD. That's the most common type of storage, and I hope it's close enough to EMMC, though the performance could be different. But at least um, let's let's get started and and see what we can get from there. So uh, the first thing you can check is whether a device is solid state or not. There's a nice uh, file in uh, sys, in slash sys, that's, pop, that's populated by the block uh, interface uh, to tell you whether a device is uh, rotational or not. Um, so if it contains zero, it should not be rotational. Uh, so this works actually for MMCSD, but it doesn't work for uh, USB mass storage, unfortunately, which doesn't, I guess, know what kind of device it is. Uh, that doesn't seem to be part of the USB specification. It's just storage. So let's see the available file systems first. The oldest one, X2, introduced in 1993, uh, still actively supported. If you look, uh, there's low metadata overhead. It's uh, the module is small, so it's nice uh, in terms of RAM usage and space. Uh, however, it's not very well suited for embedded systems because you, um, if you abruptly shut down the machine or you crash, uh, you can have data corruption, metadata corruption. You need to run FSCK, uh, and it means someone, someone has to look at the results. So that's, that's not something uh, that will allow a device to reboot autonomously. So that was, this problem was addressed by introduction of journaling. Uh, in, uh, for example, in uh, X3, which was what the, the successor of X2, but it wasn't scaling well, so it eventually got deprecated. And by the way, you know that journalism reduces corruption and loss of information. I hope you agree with me. <laughs> so the, um, the data range for this file system is uh, uh, 1901 until 2038. And that's actually bad. That's 32 bits. So it seems it will have to go away. Like people using X2 will have to migrate to X4 with the, the right uh, block size, or the right uh, 64-bit mode, like for, for dates. So I, I, that was that, that came as a surprise because we talk about riser FS not being uh, Y2, y, y2 um, 2038 ready, but that is the case for X2 as well. So X4 is the modern successor of X2, introduced in 2006 with uh, journaling, 
without the scaling limitations of uh, X3, still actively developed. But uh, according to uh, the Tetso, who's the one of the gurus of file systems, it still created uh, as a stopgap uh, based on old technologies. So um, it's not like the, the greatest that we can do. Um, you, with the X4 driver, by the way, you can support X3 and X2 at the same time. So you don't need to have to uh, select X2 and X3 if you want to support those. Just keep the X4 driver, and I think it has an option to support those ones in a single driver. Don't need to have multiple ones. Uh, it supports transparent compression, encryption. In case you didn't know, that's, that was introduced more recently. There's no compression available in, uh, Squash F uh, in uh, X4, though. Uh, I, ch the, I check the date range, so if your product doesn't need um, a warranty that, that's more than 400 years, that's going to be fine. Um, I check the minimum, minimum partition site to have a journal, it's 8 megabytes, and in that case, uh, anyway, 8 megabytes, and you can, have a very, you can have X4 on a very small partition uh, without a journal, uh, <laughs> 256. Uh, K uh, partition if necessary if only to th 32 inodes. So that's possible. So you can make it as, you can make, use it on a very small partition. You create a file system with MKFS X4, all the ones are like that. There's also XFS, which is also a journaling file system which uh, dates back from 1994. It wasn't int introduced in Linux uh, at, back then, but it was developed for uh, IREX from Silicon Graphics. Um, actively maintained and developed by Red Hat uh, now, like it's the default, uh, it seems like the default file system that, that, they, that, that they promote in uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux and, 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 and Fedora, it seems. Um, so it's, uh, it's powerful, well developed, well, well, well maintained. Uh, so the features are uh, using a variable block size if you want, uh, direct IO, online growth, so things that could be nice in some systems. The minimum partition size is 16 megabytes. Um, and yeah, you, you create a file system with MKFS, XFS. When I don't mention the upper limit of the partitions, it's like so huge that it's, it's gonna be fine for embedded systems like petabytes of storage. Uh, but for the first, it's another Czech uh, file system. Well, English people say better, but better FS, better FS, or B3 FS. So uh, it's a modern file system with many uh, features, it's, it's like a dream uh, file system for people, storage experts, I guess, because they can do whatever they want. They have like great features, snapshotting, um, compression, encryption, I guess, and so on. It's, 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 it's big, it's a big, it's, it's big beast, but uh, I guess you can tweak it to do exactly what you want. Um, and the minimum partition size is nine, 109 megabytes, so still not too, too, too big. Uh, one that was introduced Earlier, uh, no, earlier, later was uh, F2FS from initially from people uh, at Samsung. Um, it's it's this one is specifically designed for uh, SSD storage, like solid state storage, trying to uh, take advantage of the fact that you have solid state and not rotating. So uh, maximize the performance and also increase the life expect expectancy. So it's actually tr it's trying to make most writes sequential. That works best on SSD. You have um, transparent encryption in F2FS with various uh, encryption schemes. You have support for uh, so, uh, setting that on, file, on, on a file-by-file -file basis. You can choose, please encrypt this file with this scheme. Uh, it's using um, extended attributes for, for doing so. And you don't have like size limits, though it's not like huge, like 16 terabytes is the maximum size for the partitions, so like it's not Huge, but still acceptable, I guess, right? And if, yeah, the, fact si the max file size is four terabytes, which is still big. Uh, another one that's not so popular is NILFS, uh, also known as NILFS2, introduced by some folks at uh, NTT. It's maintained, uh, people keep working on it. It's not uh, maybe uh, as actively maintained as F2FS, for example, but it's still active and alive. So this one treats the storage as a circular buffer. It's quite, uh, it's quite different from the others. New blocks are always written uh, to the end. So it's, it's weird because you don't lose anything. So uh, you, you can uh, access, you have an like, automatic snapshot. You can roll back to uh, any previous state of the file system if you want. Um, so 
Yeah, so you can easily restore uh, files that were uh, deleted uh, recently enough. <laughs> that's, that's fine. So, uh, but there's a weird behavior when I tried it for the first time. You actually um, can fill up the, uh, uh, the, the, the the space if you don't clean up, like because of the snap notch shuttings. You have even if you remove files, they're not removed because they're still in the history. So what you need is um, is a, a, a daemon that's called nilfs cleanerd that will take care of removing. Uh, uh, say, uh, garbage collecting, kind of uh, reclaiming the space corresponding to um, removed files. So if, if you're using this one and you do a lit, lot of uh, read and writing, it's good to run NILFS cleaner D. And before you unmount, you have to kill that, stop that daemon as well. <laughs> so that's a bit unusual for, uh, for a file system, at least from my perspective. Uh, it's supposed to be great at latency, minimizing seek time, uh, yep, and being the best at handling many small files. And you create the file system with MKFS, NILFS2. Nothing special here. Then let's talk about the read-only file systems. There's SquashFS. Um, that's been around for quite a while. It's been in mainline since 2009. It was even uh, available as separate patches before. Uh, it's actively maintained. It's fine for parts of the file system which are read-only, like if you update your file system like uh, in one shot, like flash the, old, the whole root file system in one shot, you could have the file system completely uh, read-only, you don't want to make, if you don't want to make file-by-file -file updates. So it's used a lot in USB uh, and uh, CD uh, live distributions. It supports several algorithms for compression, as you can see here. Uh, and this one is supposed to give priority to compression rate versus the performance, the read performance. So well, it works well for even for small partitions, like you can have like a uh, 120K, maybe partition, whatever works. You create the uh, file system image on your PC with mix squash FS. It's no, there's no point in creating the file system on the on the target machine because you would create you could create an empty partition, but if it's read-only, you can't add files to it. So oops. Um, so that's why you create it from the ex an existing existing directory on the host machine. EuroFS is the new kid on the block. Uh, that's that's in mainline since uh, 2019. Maybe it's been there before in staging, but now it's uh, in the mainline tree, uh, developed by guys at uh, Huawei, uh, uh, and it's used in, in their phones. And this one is trying to give priority to uh, read performance versus compression. Uh, so EuroFS actually works by compressing, uh, putting the compressed data into fixed 4K blocks. So the blocks always have the same size, the optimal size for the storage. So that's why you don't, there's no waste of space. Uh, unlike SquashFS, with, which is taking a fixed size block first and then put it in comp a compressed chunk, but thanks to compression, you don't know what kind of size you, you're gonna get. So you have variable size compressed blocks with, with SquashFS. Uh, with, apparently with EuroFS as well, uh, you can have a random access to files in directories. You don't have to be sequential in looking for a file in the directory. That, that's better. And it's also suitable for small partitions. And you, have, you run MKFS, EuroFS on your host machine as well from a given directory. Uh, file systems we, di we didn't test uh, X2 because it's obsolete uh, in, in, in 15 years. JFS is supported, but legacy, so like uh, nobody really uses this much and the tools are not available everywhere. Uh, ResRFS lacks support and it's going away in a few years according to discussions I read about. CrimeFS is supported but legacy and who wants, who needs SquashFS or CrimeFS when you have SquashFS and EuroFS. And BcacheFS is new but it's not in mainline yet. <laughs> so please wait a few weeks or months and invite me again. <laughs> uh, so let's first do some raw benchmarks. Um, uh, first, let me show you how um, an SD card is organized. So basically, SD card, an SD card is uh, an, a microcontroller, a bit of RAM, and this is all controlling uh, non-flash pages, so uh, uh, non-flash non space. So in non-flash, what you have is erase blocks that contain multiple um, pages. That, that, that's the unit for reading and writing. And when you want to um, write a page twice, for example, you have to erase the complete erase block. However, you in uh, SD cards, it's uh, the erase size is actually uh, wider than that because you if you, you you have limited RAM and and addressable content, so I mean it's easier to erase multiple erase blocks at the same time. And this is and this is what we call a segment. It's a group of erase blocks that are handled as a unit by by the uh, 
by the firmware on the, uh, on the MCU. So typic the typical size for this is four meg, as we will see, four megs, yeah. But, but you have like a millions, no, no, well, hundreds, thousands and thousands of those. So I took a few uh, SD cards that I had. I wanted to find the best one for the, the benchmarks uh, that, that, that are coming after that. So the, the first attempt was to find the page size for those SD cards. Uh, it's pretty easy to do. You just read. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was reading like um, uh, a 64 megabyte image, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, no, I was actually right, writing to the storage. And I'm doing that in, uh, in different block sizes with DD. So starting with 512, and then the next multiple of two, 4K, and one meg, etc., until, uh, until 64 megabytes in one shot, like one single write. And what I found in, in most of the tests is that the, you have optimal performance when you write a page, a page which is like 4K in, in, the, in this one. And if you look at the other ones, sometimes it's 1K the best one, but at least with, uh, with 4K, you always have like the best performance. So I guess they have optimizations for writing to less than a page. Like if it's, if it's, uh, if it's uh, to uh, like 1K, for example. So um, what I'm learning from that is that when you want to write an image, write to an SD card, like uh, write an image to an SD card, don't use the default DD command because it's like it's going to be 512 bytes. That's the default doc size for for DD, and the performance is like it's, it's going to be three or four times worse as if you used 4K as a block size. In the past, I was naive and I thought that the bigger the block size would be. Uh, the faster it would be, and that's actually wrong according to those results. Um, 4K is enough, and it actually makes sense. You just write sequentially things, and uh, as, as long as it's, it's big enough, like 4K, uh, you sequentially write those, and the SD cards are optimized for, for, the, for this, this kind of scenario. So, yeah, 4K is, a, is, a, is the block size. <laughs> uh, ultimately, uh, the best one in terms of performance was this SD card from uh, SanDisk. So that's, what the, that's the one I kept. That's the, that's the first time, by the way, I, I, I scan an SD card with a scanner <laughs> because my, my phone camera couldn't do that. It's too, too, too small. Uh, the next thing you want, you want to see is to infer the segment size. So there's a tool from Arne Bergman that he wrote originally in 2011 or something like that. Um, that's, and there's a nice talk about, a uh, nice uh, article on Linux Week News that's called Optimizing Linux for with cheap flash devices. The idea is to find uh, the segment size, like you, you write before, uh, you, you take some powers of two, like you assume that the segment is maybe uh, four, 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 mega, four megabytes, like here, so you write, you, you read right before the, the boundary, like a, yeah, a, few, a few bytes away from that. You read uh, on, the, on the boundary and after the boundary, or well, close to the boundary, and, and you see the, you, you, you're supposed to see a, a change in performance because the hardware has to switch from one segment to another one, so there's a, an extra cost of, of, of switching. And actually, in this case, you see here, when you read very small, uh, when you do experiments with uh, very small chunk sizes, the, the performance stays the same, and then it jumps at four megabytes all of a sudden. So that's, that was the intent of this tool to kind of help detecting the um, the segment side and here it's obviously uh, for for four megabytes so yeah because you read before read after and if you read across it's like it's more because of the switch like read before and right after uh, so that's the tool you can use it's packaged by uh, by package managers so just install it or compile it with Yocto. Um so I, I made some tests here. It's a bit less obvious. Um, I know that's, that's, that's something else. So here I just, uh, on some SD cards, it was easy with FlashBench. You obviously had a one result. And with other ones, that was like uh, harder to interpret. But at least uh, four megabytes turned out to be a good, uh, good candidate. Uh, good, good, uh, it, it could have been two megabytes, maybe, because of the performance change. But if you use four megabytes instead, two megabytes never hurts to have a a close multiple of that as a segment size. So especially if you, uh, that impacts the, the, uh, the layout of the file system. Okay, um, I, did, I made some read, raw read tests as well on uh, SD cards. And you see, uh, that's the most spectacular case here. You have a, a really um, a, a, a jump performance when you start reading. 
something like one megabyte at, at, at a time, or you can simplify and assume it's one segment at a time. So when you read uh, from an SD card to dump like with DD, uh, it's good to use one, me one meg or something like that. One meg or four megs, fine. So at last, the file system benchmarks. So I'm gonna compare X4 with X4. <laughs> that's, the, that's the strategy here. Uh, uh, trying to get the best options for each file system and then let them compete. So yeah, uh, with X4, there's nothing special I could find. It's designed for block storage, so I didn't find anything to help. With uh, solid states, uh, the default size is 4K, which is good according to the test we've made. Good size. Uh, and then you have profiles. So if you if you actually fill uh, run MKFS the X2 or X4, uh, it will actually pick uh, a profile that's defined in this file according to the size of your um, of, of your partition or your image. And this this is a kind of optimal uh, for optimum for uh, in terms of number of IOs, block size, etc. So that just for your information. XFS versus XFS didn't find anything, but uh, XFS uses a 4K block size, so it's good. Uh, ButterFS versus ButterFS. There are more options here, so it's, it's interesting. You have a 4K block size, so it's good. Um, MKFS.ButterFS actually detects when you're using an SSD, when it's mounted on an SSD, so it's nice. Um, so in the past, when you used MKFS, ButterFS with a, a partition which was a solid state, uh, it created the file system with an option that's called M single, so you don't duplicate metadata uh, on, on on the physical physical storage for extra security, for est, um, extra reliability, I guess, uh, which corresponds to M dup duplicate. So, writing twice. Uh, however, in recent versions of um, MKFS but RFS, they decided to uh, to switch back to uh, always duplicating the metadata because the information that I told you about whether a device is rotational or not is not trustworthy. So they prefer to be on the safe side. So there's a document here that explains uh, what, what this does. I made some tests and indeed um, makefs.butterfs, like that's the test I'm going to do uh, in the, when I, I compete between file systems. Uh, it has an, some impact on, uh, I mean, that's with, with dup, the single, sorry, uh, on on read write time, it's mostly write time, of course, as you can expect. So, um, and it reduces space a little bit as well. That's the use space. No, no, no that's the space. But, and, um, and it's good for performance. So we keep this option. So we'll use um, ButterFS with this option. So remember, M, MKFS, MDUP. You have SSD options in, M, uh, in ButterFS. SSD, SDC spread, and uh, no SSD. By default, it's uh, SSD when you have a, a, a storage device that's detected as SSD. But if you have like a USB key, you could turn it on if you want. So I compared um, SSD and no SSD, and actually didn't see uh, a change, a noticeable change. So not keeping it. Uh, I, I also tried SSD spread, which was according to Arch Linux was a good option to use, but I had no space left on device errors. So something weird was happening, so I didn't, couldn't really use, use that one. You have compression options in uh, ButterFS, as I told you. So you, um, that's an add mount time for new files, I guess. So uh, you, you can use uh, compression, um, no compression, Zlibs, LZO, and ZSTD. Um, and uh, if you see here, so that's the tests with uh, the various compressors, uh, the blue one being the one without compression. It help, the compression will help a little bit with read time, like a little bit here, but it uh, significantly hurts the, the write time. Even though it's acceptable with the LZO, which is fast, not compresses, compressing very well, but it's fast. So ultimately, I'm, at least on this, uh, I'm using BeagleBone Black, so one gigahertz uh, CPU. Um, at least with this CPU, that wasn't worth it to use uh, the compression here. Um, by the way, compression is smart anyway, so it gives up. If a file turns out not to be compressible, it will try and see, mm, I'm not getting much, so I, I drop and I, I continue like uncompressed. So that's that's acceptable here. That's 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 actually quite smart. If if you really want compression, you could use LZO because it's the best performance and compression ratio. Uh, and if the, the compression rate is really key for you, more than performance, use Zlib according to our tests, not ZSTD. 
So all this depends on actually what kind of file system activity you have on your systems. Uh, F2FS versus F2FS. This was a fun one as well. I, I, I struggled a bit to find out uh, how to compress, to turn on compression on uh, F2FS. Uh, you actually have to create the file system with the compression option, like, 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 like those two, uh, and extra attributes. And then you need to mount the file system with uh, compressed, uh, with some mount options. Compress extension equals star. You want to have all files compressed because you could like have like uh, only files of given type that are compressed, or each type you could say please compress it <laughs> with uh, attributes. And then you choose the compress algorithm here. Um, and well, it uh, it actually didn't uh, provide compression didn't provide any sizable benefits yet. So it was always worse than, at least on my CPU and storage, always, almost always worse than, um, than with compression, without compression, except in the video write, uh, like sequential, uh, hard to compress. I don't know exactly why here, but it's not worth it, in, uh, at least in my case. I also tried other options that were recommended by Art Linux, like lazy time and garbage collection options, but they didn't help with fight performance, except marginally in some cases, so was to be on safe side, I kept the, the default options for F2FS eventually. Uh, the, the last one was uh, NILFS2. I didn't find any mount option uh, supposed to help. Uh, you have the, all the mount options here. Uh, and the block sizes that are, uh, the, 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 you can specify a, a block size when you create um, MKFS and it's uh, not, uh, with MKFS. The, the default values are good like 4K for uh, the block size and a segment size of uh, for 8M. So, so that's that's okay. Uh, I mean, that's a double of the segment size we have on the RSD cards, but that should be fine as, as we saw. Uh, comparing SquashFS versus SquashFS. So uh, I ultim uh, the idea was to prepare an image with a Raspberry Pi OS Lite file system, like 1.2 gigabytes uh, based on ARM binary. So lots of small files, uh, which can be compressed pretty efficiently. And, and then I, uh, I compared the uh, size, and that's in blue, and the performance, that's in uh, red. And the, the best results I got was LZO, uh, a little faster than LZ4, um, and with not compressing as well, but was a good trade-off, in my opinion. Best performance. Uh, I s tried other options, but that they didn't help. You can read, uh, like, direct uh, decompression to the file cache. That's, that I expected that to help, but that didn't in my case. Uh, by the way, with SquashFS, you also have options for um, multi-threaded decompression. Uh, having a single core CPU, uh, at least in those tests, uh, I didn't try those. They, they, they probably can help as well. Uh, comparing EROFS vers uh, versus EROFS, you, uh, same, same file system. Um, the best one was a uh, compression option Compression option that was called micro, that is called micro LZ, LZMA, uh, with the maximum compression option. That's what that's the one that gives you the best uh, performance uh, and size. So that's the one I chose. Uh, P, uh, big P cluster didn't help. That's another option. Uh, so yeah, the, the the best one is really uh, that's a zoom in. Uh, because otherwise you couldn't see. So the, the best one is this one, effectively, with a micro LZMA with compression 12. There's just a penalty on the machine creating the image, but that's not the embedded system, so we don't care. Yes. So the real comparisons now, um, if you compare the module size of those file systems, the winner or the loser is uh, ButterFS. It's uh, two megabytes of module size for ARM 32-bit with, um, with dependencies. So whoa. So it, it's, 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 it's meaningful in terms of boot time. The modern loading time is, of course, biggest with um, ButterFS, though it's not exactly linear compared to the module size. But, yeah. Uh, and then the mounting time. Once the module is loaded, you mount a part one partition. Uh, the worst case is NIL2FS. NIL, no, NIL, NILFS2, sorry. <laughs> And second ones are F2FS and XFS, but those ones are acceptable. Like less than zero to two seconds is fine. And then the, the big picture is module loading time plus mounting time. That's, that's, that's what you get when you uh, try to mount a root file system with this file system. 
so that, that's the boot time impact of this. If you use this at root file system, the worst one is ButterFS indeed. So that's, that's not a good choice for, 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 for boot time. So you could use ButterFS, but in another partition with where you store data typically, but not as a root file system. I wouldn't recommend it. In terms of use space, not a surprise, SquashFS was the best one. So you're like, like just running DU and it tells you. Um, SquashFS is the best one. EuroFS is second. Uh, so if compression matters, um, I mean size matters, and you can have a read-only file system, it's a good choice. Reading time now. Um, so here I'm reading the contents of the file system that we took the Raspberry Pi, uh, Raspberry Lite one. So I just uh, tar, um, let create a tar archive uh, from the, the, the contents of the mounted file system, and I write this to NetNull, so there's no write. It was an easy way to write, uh, read all the files. So the, the winner is F2FS, as you can see, and the, uh, no, well, F2FS for read-write file systems, but the, the best one, as expected, is EROFS, which is giving priority to read performance. And the next one, of course, is uh, SquashFS, still compressed, and you can really pack the data very efficiently, so it wins over, over read-write file systems that have to keep space for future reads and writes, future writes. Writing time, it's, it's funny here because it's kind of linear. So the best writing time I got, so here I'm copying a, a Debian, an old Debian root file system that's three, 320K. I'm copying it five times to, uh, to the partition. And we, the, the, best, the best one is actually X4, that's a surprise. <laughs> and yes, you can, you can see that. Um, so uh, Linux feed at 6.3, big bone black on ARM. Uh, and then I, uh, I continue the test and uh, I actually remove one directory out of five and, and copy the, late, the oldest one that's remaining to a new one. So it's reading, erasing, reading and writing, right? Uh, so the, um, the best one, uh, surprisingly, um, NIST2, uh, NIL FS2 uh, and close uh, is uh, F F2FS as well. So lots of tests, I, I, I'll try to um, to highlight a few lessons learned from this, at least in my use case. Uh, the removal time is like quite, quite long. It's, all, I, it's always feels weird, weird the, the time you need to erase a directory in Linux. Well, because probably it needs to be done atomically, so it's a complex uh, operation. Uh, the best one was definitely by far uh, NILS FS2. So if your system is mostly about removing files, <laughs> that's the choice. <laughs> Um, and then sequential write time. Sequential write time, I'm, I'm, I'm copying a video, Big Bug Bunny, of course, uh, five times to the storage. So I copy it for, to, on a RAMFS first so that like, I don't have like, any penalty uh, reading from it. Copying five, five times, and yes, that's what you get. Uh, XFS was the, be the, the best one. So <laughs> it's difficult because yeah, the winners are different every time. Uh, and the sequential read time, here doesn't seem to be anything weird, uh, except NILFS2, which is uh, slower. So reading a video for five times. And that's the big picture with the various tests I made. Um, so it has a, I prepared a summary from all this. Um, so if you look, ultimately X4 is still kind of the best default choice. If like, the, the one you, you, you would pick up uh, before you make your own tests, you could, you could I mean, uh, X4 is a trustworthy one, actually, in most, it's, it's getting good results, uh, sometimes the best results. So yeah, it's a good, still good default choice. That's interesting, at least in this case, right? Uh, small embedded board with, um, with a single core CPU. Then you see, um, NILFS2 is, can have the best results in some cases, but you can also have the worst ones. So it really depends on what kinds of file system activity you have. Uh, and then you have like uh, XFS, ButterFS, F2FS, which are almost like close to each other, let's say. So let me summarize in the next slide. And of course, the read-only file systems are great. Uh, they just read, and that's uh, easier. <laughs> so they, they, are, they are doing the best job there. So, um, things to remember from those tests. Uh, remember that X2 is going away. Um, EROFS is the fastest uh, read-only file system. 
uh, as expected. Squash FS is the best one for minimizing space, right? And has still very good read performance. Um, a good default choice is X4, effectively. Uh, if you, unless you, until you make your own test, you can pick up X4 and get good results. Uh, F2FS, in my mind, seems to be the best second choice. Uh, and then you have ButterFS, which uh, turns out to be bulky, complicated, and, but, but powerful. Uh, and if you, but at least if you use it with M single, is a good, is also a solid choice, except for boot time. Um, and yeah, so if you want to tune things, you have like many more options, so it can, it can be interesting. Um, you have lo lots of options in F2FS as well. And FXFS is also a pretty good choice. Uh, easy to use and not too bulky. Um, like about, about the same size as X2, so uh, X4, I mean. Right. So uh, another thing is that compression doesn't help with perf doesn't seem to help with performance, at least when you have a single core CPU. And yeah, as I said, NILFS2 can give you uh, great results sometimes, uh, but also sometimes the worst ones. So just test on, on your own system. So always try with your own hardware and your own applications, like run your system test and see which ones behave the best. It's easy to switch file systems. Um, just format the, the partition differently, adjust the, 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 the MKFS options and the mount options, and that's it. That's transparent for our applications. Some more lessons learned. Uh, so when you flash an SD card with DD, the page size is, you, is the thing that the, the parameter, like BS in um, DD, will give you the best results uh, in terms of copying. So use this, this and you will divide the copy time by, by four. Uh, don't exceed one megabyte. That, that doesn't help. That slightly degrades performance uh, as a block size. If you read from an SD card with DD, the, back, the segment size is one of the best block sizes for reading. So read with uh, BS equal 1M or 4M if you want. Uh, bigger won't help. I, by the way, uh, tried to use a flashbench-f. It's uh, supposed to try to find some special segment that's actually optimized for fat, um, like the SD card manufacturers like to do that. Um, so that when you uh, benchmark with a FAT and you write that always to the same location, uh, that's sufficient. Uh, but at least on the SD cards I had, I didn't find anything noticeable. Weird. And anyway, uh, if your idea was to put the journal where the FAT is, the journal is something you access very frequently as well. Um, with X4 and others, it won't fit anyway. Uh, it's too big. Like it's like 120. Um, for, for, for like a big enough partition, it could be uh, megabytes, uh, like tens of megabytes of size, so too, too, too big, sorry. Uh, but what you could do with the journal to uh, improve performance is store it elsewhere. If you have fast of performance out there, um, you could, with those file systems, you can choose to have the, the file system outside of the block storage that you're using to store files. So it's, it's like there's uh, very fast non-volatile memory or something like that you could store the journal there. That's a, that's a possibility too. Uh, of course, uh, uh, I ran out of time. To, uh, I needed time to automate my tests. Uh, so that, that took time to resurrect the scripts I used like 13 years ago. Um, so I didn't have the time to, uh, to run on tests on ARM64 with a faster CPU and multiple cores. So that's something I need to do next time. I haven't tested real random writing, uh, like modifying random files, random locations in random files and random reading as well. And I only made tests on one SD card, not on eMMC that could yield different results. And uh, I haven't tried uh, USB or NVMe, SATA, et cetera, yet. So it's, a, it's a one particular use case for uh, embedded devices, but uh, hopefully the mount options can help, that I found can help uh, in your projects. Uh, resources here, uh, you have a great talk about, from uh, quite old now, but uh, from Peter Chubb um, at uh, linux.org.au uh, about SD cards, how they are organized and how they perform. Uh, and there's the nice talk from uh, Richard as well uh, on our EROFS versus SquashFS in case you, is he here maybe? <laughs> yeah, hi Richard. <laughs> thanks, thanks for the, the, the nice write-up. <laughs> And now we have maybe a little bit of time for questions, not so much, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Is there a microphone somewhere? No, go, go ahead, I'll repeat the question. Do you have any uh, final consideration from the uh, liability point of view? 
I mean in case of power loss with this kind of system? Haven't tried. Um, oh, yes, sir. So, questions about the reliability of the, the file systems in case you have a power loss? Um, no. Uh, I just know that with the SD card, you have like a power pin that extends. Uh, that's when you uh, remove the signal pins. But the, the, I mean, the power pin is longer, the, the, the signal pins are shorter. So when you uh, remove the SD card, it should have a little time to complete the operations on the flash. Um, before, I mean, the, the card will, be, will stay uh, powered a little more time, but I don't know, I haven't tortured my, 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 my SD cards to know uh, how they will survive. But normally with journal file systems, it's quite robust. Oh. Uh, yeah, not always, maybe you have experience. Yes. <laughs> okay, so we can talk uh, after, uh, after uh, I'll be around. Thank you. Thank you.